Hello again, everybody. This will be a talk on subglottic stenosis. Subglottic stenosis is one of our major airway malformations. Uh, however, what I want you to take out of this when I say malformations is that this isn't necessarily congenital. Uh, so indeed, some subglottic stenoses are congenital. However, it can happen secondary to an injury or secondary to an inflammatory process, etc. So I don't want you to come away thinking that all of these are necessarily in utero malformations. Uh, these can be obstructions uh, and acquired lesions as well. Okay, so the subglottic stenosis uh, tends to be in the cricoid cartilage region. Uh, we talk about laryngomalacia. That tends to be superglottic structures, meaning above the vocal cords, above uh, the vocal folds. And then tracheomalacia is obviously going to be uh, a malformation of the trachea. So we'll go over our relevant anatomy. We'll do a brief overview. I'll show you how this typically presents, how you can work this up, what your differential diagnosis will be, and then how we go about managing this. So here's our relevant anatomy, uh, or at least part of it. So uh, here you have uh, the oropharynx uh, coming into the laryngopharynx here. Um, and then your laryngeal structures, uh, you have your tracheal cartilage right here. This is where your Adam's apple is going to be, although you're not going to really be able to feel that on a child. Uh, this is your hyoid bone. This is a good landmark to, uh, to look for uh, on a child. You should be able to easily palpate that. Um, and then your cricoid cartilage is right down here. Um, and so uh, this is where the cricoid cartilage area is roughly where the subglottic stenosis tends to affect. Now remember that the cricoid cartilage in a child is the narrowest portion of the airway. And so if you have a stenosis of that region, you're going to have some significant uh, airflow issues. So this is an anterior view. Various structures have been dissected here, including the mandible, the teeth, the oral cavity, uh, lots of muscles. So here's your hyoid bone, your thyroid cartilage, your cricoid cartilage, and the trachea down here. So this is affecting this region right here. Uh, this is the best picture I could find as far as uh, if you were to slice this uh, coronally. Uh, so here's your vocal folds, and this is where the vocal cords sit. And this is considered, this area here is considered the glottis, and then everything below that is the subglottis, and above that is the superglottis. So this is the region we're talking about here. Of course, this region will go down into the trachea. So subglottis, subglottic stenosis is a narrowing of the endolarynx at the level of the cricoid cartilage. This is the second most common cause of strider in infancy. Remember that the number one cause is laryngomalacia. This can be congenital or acquired. So when it's congenital, it is a true malformation, uh, and the symptoms will present shortly after birth. If it's acquired, it's precipitated by an insult to the subglottic airway. And most commonly in the US, that's going to be due to prolonged intubation. So you have a tube in there. Um, it will, there will be some uh, irritation, and that can uh, precipitate uh, a response, which narrows the airway. It can also be caused by infectious or inflammatory causes. We tend not to see this as much in the US, uh, particularly because uh, these causes are usually things that we just don't see here as often, uh, such as tuberculosis or diphtheria. It can be caused by GERD as well if there's chronic aspiration. So this typically presents as croup. Now that makes perfect sense because croup affects this same area. Uh, and so a way that this can present is the patient who comes in frequently with strider and this can look a lot like uh, th this can look a lot like your typical croup it can also look like spasmodic croup in as much as the patient isn't going to have a fever and they're going to have these chronic uh, strider croup like symptoms uh, just like uh, a lot of these other uh, stenoses and, uh, and malformations, the strider tends to be worse when supine, agitated, crying, and during concomitant upper respiratory tract infections. The degree of airway obstruction will vary. Uh, as we're going to see, there's four grades of subglottic stenosis, and the more obstruction there is, the more likely it's going to lead to significant respiratory distress and go on to need surgery. So remember that the presentation can be different based on 
the degree of stenosis, and also in the event that there are concomitant problems, which uh, may be the case or, or may be the cause of acquired lesions. So if there's uh, GERD, you can have uh, raspy voice, uh, reflux, and that can be part of the presentation as well. So for physical exam, you'll want to carefully assess the respiratory status. That's go that goes for anybody with Strider. Uh, you'll want to get a respiratory rate, uh, saturation, you want to know their general disposition, are they using any accessory muscles of respiration, is there nasal flaring, that's going to help you determine whether or not they're in respiratory distress. If they are, they're going to need to be admitted and observed, um, possibly even uh, intubated. You want to also assess for facial abnormalities such as cleft palate, coenal atresia, retrognathia, which can worsen, uh, can make it more difficult to breathe. A workup is going to include a laryngoscopy, which is the most accurate test and diagnosis. Uh, and uh, if you do get a radiograph, so let's say that you're considering that this might be croup, you will, in many cases, see the steeple sign. And the steeple sign is just due to the inflammation in that particular region, in that narrowing region uh, of, uh, at the level of the cricoid cartilage. Um, and so this can be very difficult to distinguish from croup. Uh, the fact is, though, with subclotic stenosis, this is an ongoing problem. It doesn't resolve. That separates it from croup and spasmodic croup, where those will be more intermittent, especially the spasmodic croup that's intermittent. Okay, so this is a normal subglottis, so we're just below the vocal cords here. And this is a subglottic stenosis. So you can see that we have normal caliber here. Um, and then there's a stenosed region right here. Now this is right at the level of the vocal cords. So you can see also that there's varying grades. Uh, grade 1 is the least severe, and that's a stenosis of a narrowing of, of 0 to 50 percent of the lumen. Uh, grade 2 is 51 to 70 percent uh, of occlusion of the lumen, and then grade 3 is 71 to 99 percent, grade 4 is a complete stenosis of the lumen. So grades 3 and 4 will typically tend to need surgery. The symptoms are going to be a lot worse. Grades 1 and 2, a lot of, a lot of these cases will not require surgery, and the subglottic stenosis, the symptoms, will generally go on to remit once the airway uh, starts to grow with the child. So here's another uh, stenosis here, right at the level of the vocal cords uh, you can see here, and then the stenosis is right here. You can see it kind of looks similar to esophageal rings in some way. Okay, so how do we manage this? You want to secure an airway in cases of significant respiratory distress. You will need to use a smaller endotracheal tube. That makes sense because if there's stenosis, you're not going to be able to get the expected size tube uh, down the trachea. First step is going to be racemic epinephrine and systemic corticosteroids. They do not cure the disease, but they can reduce the symptoms. So once you have a secure airway uh, or you decide you don't need an airway because the patient is saturating fine, you can give epinephrine and corticosteroids, particularly corticosteroids. Uh, this does tend to reduce the symptoms a little bit, but it does, obviously does not cure the disease. Uh, if they do not respond to epinephrine and steroids, or if they have significant subglottic stenosis, meaning 71% or more, grade 3 or grade 4, uh, you want to refer them immediately to a pediatric ENT. Ultimately, you are going to refer all of these patients ultimately to an ENT. You want to rule out GERD as a causative factor, because if that is the cause, then if you treat the GERD, you should be able to treat the subglottic stenosis from that, because you have GERD causing an inflammatory response, and so if you get rid of that, then uh, the stenosis should remit. So the way, you can, uh, the way you can rule that out is by a dual-channel pH probe testing. Uh, you will endoscopically insert, uh, gastroenterologists will uh, endoscopically insert a pH probe at the, uh, at the esophageal sphincter, uh, the inferior esophageal sphincter, uh, distal esophageal sphincter, and then uh, also uh, a probe uh, roughly at the uh, at the level of the uh, subglottis. All right, and then definitive treatment is surgical. Uh, you don't need to know when to do this. This will be at the call of the ENT since they're going to be doing it. 
uh, but uh, usually it's going to be performed if there's grade three or four subclotic stenosis or if there's significant uh, issues such as uh, issues with growth, uh, issues with significant respiratory distress. Um, and what they can do is a cricoid split, which will then uh, expand the area uh, that the, the trachea can, uh, can cover, um, and, or they can do reconstruction. Uh, so you don't need to know anything about those procedures uh, or really even when it needs to be done. Just know that the definitive treatment for subglottic stenosis is surgical and also know that the majority of these cases, the children will grow out of it, just like laryngomalacia. These cases, the